All right, so this morning and this evening sermon are, are really going to go hand in hand. So I encourage you, if you weren't planning on coming back for the evening service, to come back. Um, very important subject matter is being taught, but I, I was have been debating in my own mind how I wanted to do this because I, I really wanted both of them to be Sunday morning sermons where we have the most attendance and they're very important subjects. But it kind of makes more sense because there's so much overlap between these two subjects that I wanted to kind of do them both in the same day, which is what I ended up deciding to do. So, um, and the subject matters I'm teaching on, what well, I'm teaching on this morning is alcohol. And I've, and I've preached many sermons on alcohol use in the past, but then the evening I'm gonna preach on drug use. And I haven't done that in a super long time, but one entire sermon dedicated to different drugs like marijuana, cocaine, you know, all the illicit drugs and prescription drugs, okay? and kind of go over that in its own category, separate from alcohol. Alcohol is very clearly uh, described in scripture, so I want to cover that. And this morning, uh, I, I, we're, we're always teaching, I'm always going to be teaching from scripture and, and going to the Bible. That's our, our primary source of information, but I'm also going to be including a lot of, of other information as well regarding alcohol. It would be just a very teaching sermon, hopefully, uh, for people to understand that, uh, and I tell my story is alcohol, biblical and scientific truths. I mean, the truth is the truth, right? We've got the Bible that already tells us what the truth is. We know that. But sometimes it's, it's nice to, to just add some extra information, even with what the world says, even what science is, is telling us is true about these substances. And the reason why I want to do that is because Things like this, especially certain sins, sins like alcohol, people will try to find any reason to justify their sin. And if I can give every reason that's factual against that sin, then I'll try to do that. Now, our first and primary and ultimate authority is the Word of God, no matter what. If the, the Word of God is truth, so there'll definitely be enough scripture in here that it ought to convince you already anyways. But in case that's not enough... We'll, I'll be reading from various sources on the effects and the physical effects of alcohol on the body. And the problem with researching the stuff in the world is you're going to have a variety of different people saying all kinds of different things, but it's the same problem you have if you look for other pastors and teachers that are teaching on this subject. A variety of people are going to pre preach for a variety of different things, but it all still will boil down to the underlying problem is that people want to justify being able to drink alcohol. People in the world, just as much as people in the church. It's, it's out there on both sides. But the truth prevails, and the truth will prevail. And there's claims out there of, oh, well, you know, some people who drink in moderation, it's actually healthy for them. Who's ever heard that before? Drinking one glass of wine a day is good for your health. Who's heard, you've heard that before, right? Many people, many hands have gone up. We're going to cover that. Okay, I'm going to cover that. We're going to see exactly what that means. And hopefully, also, when you, when you, when you look at the world's information, you look at scientific sources. Okay, this ties in with a sermon I preached recently about getting wisdom. That you think critically about the material, about the information, about what it's saying, and about how they come to conclusions. Because when you're researching topics, oftentimes what you'll find, it's much more common to find Summaries and conclusions about studies, about, uh, about scientific research, because that's what people want to read anyway. So what, what's the conclusion? Without seeing, how did you come to this conclusion? How did you get to that point? And that is very important. We start critically thinking about things. How do people get to conclusions? Well, what did the study actually do? What was done? How did they process it? What were they considering? What are the variables? How did they can keep a controlled environment? How are they coming to these conclusions? It matters. For example, one of the things, you know, the studies about 
oh, this is good for your health. Now, look, there's many different studies that have been done, so I don't want to just broad brush it all in one. But one of them has to do with just, you know, questionnaires and monitoring people's health just based on, well, how much do people say they're drinking? Well, what about all the other causal effects of health, like diet and exercise and all these other factors that aren't being considered, but you're just looking at one portion of statistical data going, oh, well, these people all said they drank in moderation, and these people said they didn't, and these people, you know, and, and you're seeing some blip of, of well, they're, they seem to be a little bit more healthier in these areas in their, in their blood circulation, in their, in their, uh, their, their cholesterol levels, right? But if the, if the, it could be scientific research, it could be done using a scientific method, but if, if there are other variables not being considered, you have to think about that critically and examine, would this have an impact? These people came to this conclusion, okay, but they're not God. And you have to determine if it's reasonable, if it, you know, all these different things when you look at, when you look at information. So we're going to look a little bit at some of that this morning, in addition to plenty of scripture to, to hopefully give you a view. And, and what I'd love, what I'd love to have here is for that everyone that walks out of here to never touch alcohol for the rest of their lives. Amen. From the children up to the oldest adult in this room to be able to walk out of here and never drink a drop of alcohol. That's my goal. I'm not hiding anything from you. I want you to walk out of here with enough information to make the decision and say, I will never do this because there's nothing good about this. You, you, we started in Proverbs 23. Just flip back to Proverbs chapter 20, verse 1. Keep your place there. Obviously, we're going to be coming right back to it. Proverbs 20, verse number 1, the Bible reads, Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. I want you to be wise today. I don't want you deceived by wine and strong drink. I want you to understand what it really is, how it operates, how it functions in your body, so you can see that it's actually a poison, it's actually a, excuse me, a toxin, and when you go to, even to the scientific studies, when you find them, not just the editorials, not the people who are promoting what they want the science to say, there's plenty of that out there today in all different areas of research. But when you go to what the physiological effects of alcohol, you are going to find even consensus that it is poison. It is not good for you. There are... It, it, your, the body reacts to the consumption of alcohol to try to uh, counteract the effects that the alcohol is doing. Your body was designed to try to mitigate alcohol coming into your system because it's not a good thing. When you eat foods that God created, when you drink water, the body doesn't respond of trying to reject and try to counteract what's coming in your body. It uses it, right? It processes it and will use what is coming into your body for the benefit of the body, all the good things. But God designed our bodies in a way to be able to handle the introduction of toxins, of poisons, of things that don't belong there, of disease, of all these other things, to, to fight against that stuff. And at the base, when you start consuming alcohol, even with the very first drink, your body starts to counteract what is being done by the alcohol in your system. So we know that alcohol is a depressant. It's an anesthetic. Okay, it's going to depress. So do you know what your body does as soon as you start drinking alcohol? It starts producing stimulants. Because it recognizes that this is not, you, you need to keep you in balance the way that your body is supposed to be. So as soon as you start receiving this depressant in the system, your body's going to be going, no, 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 we need to counteract this, we need to balance this, and starts producing um, other chemicals to keep your body in the right place. So the stimulants are produced to counteract the depressant in your body, and then the more alcohol you consume, the more stimulants could be created, and that stimulant causes anxiety and nervousness which for many people is one of the reasons why you're having a drink to begin with. 
So you have to continue to drink to receive the, the depressing effect. But the problem then also with alcohol specifically, the way that it's consumed, it's, it's ingested. You drink it, it goes into your stomach, and this is one of the slowest means of processing uh, any type of consumption of, of any drug, any, you know, any type of um, toxin going through the belly. It's a slower process. Right, the people who take drugs, if you smoke it, if you put, it, put an IV into your vein, the, 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 the transmission of those chemicals into your body, it's all quicker, like pretty much every other way, every other means than ingesting. When you ingest it, it goes into your stomach and it gets processed differently and it goes through to the intestines that goes into the blood and then the, the, the toxic effects start having an impact on your body, okay? And the reason, you know, there's so many things, and, and I've, I've studied a lot for this. A lot of it I've knew, and I'm just refreshing my memory, and some things I learned recently. But this ties in with the addictive nature of alcohol as well. So the slow process, people will end up consuming more to get the depressing effect as your body's producing the stimulant effect to try to keep you in that balance and since the body continues to do that, you lose the sense of having that depressant, so you want to drink more. But then the intoxicating effects, it takes a little bit longer because of the, the processing through your body. So people end up drinking a lot more, seeking that depressant effect, and end up becoming intoxicated over the long haul. And that's why some people, you know, people who drink larger amounts, they become more drunk even after they quit drinking because it takes the body time to process through all the alcohol that's, that's, that's drunk. So some people will go out to bars and they'll drink and say, well, I'm going to stop drinking at 11 o'clock or whatever and I'm going to leave at like 1 a.m. I'm going to give myself a couple hours to sober up before I leave. Sometimes they're even more drunk when they leave even though they haven't been drinking because your body is continually trying to process this. You've loaded too much in your system and it takes a lot longer for it to come out of your system. It's dangerous, okay? There's, and this is, this is just how it works. I'm trying to just even decide how much I want to get into uh, all of these different subjects. Let me read for you First of all, we'll get more into scripture, but I, I want to read some of these worldly sources for you. There's one article that, that I have some information from here that's called The Impact of Alcohol on Your Body. It was written by a, 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 some doctor and medically reviewed by another doctor. Um, and this, this article says this. It says, from the first sip, alcohol impacts the body even if you don't realize it. And as we continue reading, I, want, I just want that to stick in your mind that even if you don't realize from that very first drink, alcohol is having an impact on your body. It absolutely is. And, and the reason why I make a point of that is because in this church and what I believe, what I believe the Bible teaches, which we'll get to soon enough, is that no Christian should be drinking any alcohol. Amen. That's right. You shouldn't be drinking any booze. And the worldly sources have good evidence and reasoning for this. And scriptural sources, of course, I believe also teach the same exact thing. But let's, let me continue reading here. Alcohol impacts the body immediately. As soon as you start drinking, it starts impacting your body. It impacts us both physically and psychologically from the very beginning. It impacts your mind and it impacts your body. Any amount of alcohol can diminish your judgment and functioning and even low or moderate alcohol use can have harmful effects on different organs. Even low or moderate. So that's where people say, oh, drinking in moderation. It's okay. The Bible teaches you could drink in moderation. But then we have uh, the doctors, the science saying, well, look, even low or moderate alcohol can have harmful effects on your organs. Is God ordaining that we should be consuming things that have these 
harmful effects and damaging to our organs? I would say no. Okay, but again, we'll get to the scripture on this, but just using reasoning, if this is true, it's going to be kind of hard to justify doing the damage to your body as something that God would say is, yeah, that's okay. We can all experience temporary and long-term effects of alcohol depending on our consumption. Short-term effects may include lowered inhibitions, concentration problems, coordination issues, and mood changes. So, lowered inhibitions. From the very first drink, alcohol is going to start lowering your... In What's an inhibition? It's something that's keeping you from doing things that you wouldn't normally do. It's an inhibition. So people lose their inhibitions or partially their control over their own body to do things that they wouldn't normally do. Now, some people will use alcohol as a, a means because it lowers inhibitions to do things that they really want to do, but they're too nervous or anxious to do them. And this is real common, okay? So people will, let, let's say you have a, a guy that wants to talk to some girl, some single guy, he wants to talk to someone, but he's too shy, he, he doesn't really feel like he has enough boldness or confidence to just approach the, the woman and talk to her, so he's going to drink a few drinks because it's going to make him feel more relaxed enough to not be so nervous and anxious to go and talk to this person. Okay, that's, and look, people do this all the time. I was one of them that did this, okay? I, I know what happens. This is reality. But you have to, what we have to consider is, oh, yeah, well, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal, we're going to see the impact that it has because it doesn't just lower your inhibition to talk to someone. It's going to start lowering your inhibitions for many other things as well. And what the Bible says, you're in Proverbs 23. Let's tie this in with some scripture. We might jump around a little bit here, but that's all right. You're in Proverbs 23. Look at verse number 29. The Bible says, Who hath woe, who hath sorrow, who hath contentions, who hath babbling, who hath wounds without cause, who hath redness of eyes. And these are all effects of drinking alcohol that are real that happen and we'll even see many of these i'm not necessarily going to always be pointing this out but just remember this verse as we read through this other stuff that's coming from the world that's coming from the doctors woe and sorrow are essentially the same thing right you're going to be depressed it doesn't actually alcohol doesn't actually help make you happy there's this short-term effect but the long-term effect is much, much greater than the short term. So in the short term of actually drinking booze, you can have a sensation of feeling happy, right? That's true. You'll get that. But for a much longer period after that, you won't feel happy at all when the alcohol now has left your body and you're feeling the after effects physiologically of the alcohol that's been in your system. Whether that be a hangover or not. Okay, people get, they drink a lot, and then they have these real bad effects because it, it, it does a number on your body with, with the toxin that's been in your system. You literally feel sick because you ingested poison. Of course you're going to feel sick. And people feel bad afterwards. Look, you're not happy when you got a hangover. But even if you don't get the hangover, you still will have that same processing effect of the alcohol being removed from your body. Even if it's not what you would call a hangover, it's still not giving you any benefit whatsoever. In fact, it's, it's, it's more of the opposite than whatever small, short-term, seeming effect, good effect that you might have of being a little bit more comfortable, relaxed, or happy that you get at the beginning. Now, some people don't realize this also, because typically a lot of people will drink in the evening or at night, and then they go to sleep. So the, the negative effects aren't felt or recognized as much when you're going to sleep because your body is still processing it. 
you do have those same effects. You have the stimulant that's produced from, your, from, from the body. You're not noticing as much though because you're asleep. But you know what else is happening? Your sleep isn't as good. People who are asleep with, with any of the amount of alcohol, your sleep is not gonna be in, in, as good. It inhibits your REM sleep, which is the, the most important sleep for get, making you feel like you've got enough rest. It, it's, a, it's a much lighter surface level sleep that you get. I mean, even people who pass out drunk, that's not a, a, a good sleep at all. No matter how much alcohol, it, you're, you're gonna have a worse sleep drinking alcohol than not drinking alcohol. Guaranteed. Physiological effect on the body. It's, it's, it's proven, they've, they've done studies of people drinking alcohol and going to sleep and monitoring their brain activity and monitoring their sleep. You know, the, 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 the sleep uh, um, experts, the people who, who literally watch that and try, to, and try to help people get good night's sleep. It's worse when you drink alcohol in any amount. It's worse. So we're here, let, let's get back to this. Who hath woe hath sorrow, verse 29. Who hath contentions, contentions is, you know, arguments, fightings, which anyone who's been around a bar or seen this, you know that that's true. People involved in drinking alcohol, whether it be at a party, a bar, whatever, a lot more likely to have a fight break out. Be, why? Because people are losing self-control. Going back to the inhibitions, right? There's many ways that the inhibitions being lost has an impact on your life. One of them is people get angry for smaller issues, things that shouldn't make someone super angry. Their emotions are inflamed more because of the alcohol and they end up getting in fights and arguments and contentions and even uh, not as, as well able to refrain themselves physically from getting in a physical altercation. Why? Because they've consumed alcohol. Now their inhibitions are lowered. Now they're going to do these things. Look, the Bible's telling us you have woe, you have sorrow, you have contentions, babbling. Babbling is saying a bunch of stupid things, right? Things that don't matter. We'll get into that maybe a little bit later. Who hath wounds without cause? We're definitely going to see the correlation here as well. Wounds without cause. I think there's two ways you can look at this, at least. The hangover is one, because you feel sick, you feel wounded. But of course, it's saying this in a way like, of course there's a cause, but it's like, wait, why do I feel this way? It's, it's seemingly without cause. The other way is, like literally, physically, people can get wounded and not remember what happened. And, and again, I, I, I hate to admit these things, but I will do it just if there's any way it's going to help somebody to, to allow myself to, to be shamed, I literally have a scar on my body that I woke up and had no idea how it happened. Bloody, had, had ripped through my jeans, it's on my leg, and I, to this day I have a scar on my body, don't know how it happened. From being in a condition of, of, of drinking alcohol. Wounds without cause, it's real, okay, it's real. I'm a living testimony, the word of God is true. You, but don't prove it for yourself. <laughs> please, please listen to someone else who unfortunately has been there, but even more importantly than my testimony, listen to the word of God for what it says. Amen. Let God be true, but every man a liar. Who hath redness of eyes? And of course, you know, when people drink, they start to, their pupils get dilated and you start to see like your eyes literally get glossed over and become red. You can see the more of the blood vessels kind of popping out in your eyes. They that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine. Verse 31 says, look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth its color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. I might come back to this, but this is where I say no believer should have any alcohol because it's saying not to even look on it. And we don't look on it when it is in a certain condition, when it's alcoholic is what's being described here. Alcoholic wine as opposed to non-alcoholic wine. And that is a whole nother conversation, a whole nother sermon for another day. 
discussing the differences between alcoholic wine and non-alcoholic wine in scripture because the word wine is used for a variety of things. It's used in, in many places in scripture. The, the good wine that's called a blessing that cheers the heart of man, that's a good thing that God has given, is non-alcoholic. It's not fermented. It's juice. Okay, it's the fruit of the vine. It's the blood of the grape. That is what the Bible is referring to when it's talking about the good wine, as opposed to this type of wine that giveth its color in a cup and moveth itself aright as a result of the fermentation process as it's starting to produce the CO2 and is becoming fermented and it's moving as opposed to just regular juice that's not just moving around. This has now become alcoholic and he's saying don't even look at it. Don't even look at it. But let's keep going. At the last, it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. Both uh, snakes are poisonous. And it's describing that's what the alcohol is going to do to you because it's poison. Verse 33, thine eyes shall behold strange women. Strange means it's not your wife. You're going to start looking on women that aren't your wife. And your heart is going to be uttering perverse things. And you're going to start having a lack of inhibitions where normally you are inhibiting yourself from beholding strange women, from uttering perverse things out of your heart. You'll be like, no, right? You're consciously aware of these things and you're, and, you're, and you're going to be stopping them and having control and being temperate over your body and saying no. But as soon as you start drinking, those inhibitions start to be removed. And, and think about this, too, because people will always want to say, well, if you just drink in moderation, right, you'll be okay because you're not getting drunk. As soon as you start drinking, your inhibitions get lowered. So if you have your rule in place to not drink to get drunk and to not drink too much, that in itself is going to be lowered. Your, your ability to withstand even your own rules that you're setting forth to not drink more than you should is being lowered just by starting to drink. How many times, I and mean, look, this happens a lot. People start drinking not with the intent of drinking too much, and then they end up drinking too much. Why? Because their inhibitions have been lowered. Oh, everyone's having a good time. Oh, sure, I'll have another. And now you're drunk. You know who doesn't get drunk? The person who doesn't even have the first drink. That's how you're guaranteed not to get drunk. Guaranteed. Your eyes shall be old, strange women, and the heart shall utter perverse things. Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or as he that lieth upon the top of a mast. So this is the ill effects, the sick effects, the sick feeling of drinking too much alcohol and getting sick. You're going to feel dizzy and, and disoriented and... and even hard to walk and hard to stand and sick, maybe even vomit, right? Think about seasickness is kind of what's being described here. They have stricken me, thou shalt say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me and I felt it not. Why? Because it's a depressant, because it's an anesthetic, because the impact is going to make you not feel things as much, which is one of the reasons why people go to alcohol to begin with, is I don't want to feel. But the problem is you do feel, and you feel way worse afterwards. You have this short time, very short time of, oh, I'm not feeling, yeah, this is great, I'm escaping from all my problems. But you don't escape from your problems. You just make them worse. You, you, you drink the alcohol, it, it, it's bad on your body, it's bad psychologically, it's bad all the way around. It's going to cause you to get into even more sin. Look at this. They beat me, I felt it not. When shall I wake? I will seek it yet again. And that is the addictive nature of alcohol. You, you deal with the problems, you deal with the babbling, you deal with the fightings, you deal with the sick feelings, but then you're still going to go back and, and say, yeah, let's do it again. And there's two ways of being addicted to things. There's psychologically as well as physiologically. And both 
can happen. And in fact, I think it's easier to get psychologically addicted to things than it is physiological, at least especially with alcohol. I'm going to continue reading or going through this list. The short-term effects of alcohol, back to the, to the worldly document here by the doctors. You have lowered inhibitions, concentration problems, so not able to focus as well, coordination issues, and mood changes. Longer-term effects may include cognitive decline, the ability to think. So you want, you, you want to just keep drinking alcohol? It's going to affect your ability to think, cognition. Kidney disease, stroke, alcoholic liver disease, cardiovascular problems. Well, isn't that interesting? Cardiovascular problems, that's with your heart. You know, they want to say, oh, you drink a glass of wine a day, it's going to be healthier for you. Well, the long-term effects of alcohol is cardiovascular problems. Diabetes. Because alcohol is a depressant, it can also contribute to mental health conditions like anxiety and depression, which is what people turn to alcohol for. The anxiety, the depression, oh, I want to feel good, oh, I don't want to be as nervous, so I'm, let me drink alcohol. Alcohol causes that because it's a depression, a depressant. So you're going to this thing, this substance, to try to solve your problem, and it's just going to make it worse. It's just going to make it worse. Research indicates that heavy alcohol use can also increase the risk of suicide. Alcohol use can damage the hippocampus, the part of your brain responsible for memory and learning. Some studies have found that even light, some studies have found, listen to this, that even light or moderate drinking can lead to some deterioration of the hippocampus. It kills your brain cells is what that's saying. You drink, it kills brain cells. And, and this is one that I am so sorry that I ever had to get involved with this to begin with. It's one of the reasons why I preach so hard against this on a regular basis. Because I know for a fact my brain used to be sharper and it's not just because of my age right now. It was the, the too many years and abuse of substances that literally can, you, you can feel the difference of, of the, the dulling of the senses. And the dulling of the sharpness of the wit of the quickness of your mind, what substance abuse will do to you. And alcohol, even in, it says here, some studies say that even light or moderate drinking can lead to some deterioration of the hippocampus. As a result, prolonged alcohol use is associated with cognitive decline and dementia, including early onset dementia. Alcohol is a known trigger of headaches and migraines. Drinking can harm your heart muscle and influence your heartbeat and heart rate. Now, it's funny because the same science, the science will tell you it's bad for your heart. It's bad for your heart muscle. It could influence your heartbeat, your heart rate. Oh, but alcohol is good for you if you drink it once a day, one, a glass a day because it's going to help your heart. They're not both true, which is why you need to look more in depth. And look, this is more of a summary as well, what I'm showing you today, reading for you today. But when you look into the details more to see, well, what is the research? What are the studies? What are they saying? And you'll find that this is, this is true. Alcohol use has been linked to a number of heart problems, including high blood pressure, art, atrial fibrillation, alcoholic cardiomyopathy, and heart failure. These are all effects of drinking alcohol on your heart. Your liver produces enzymes that break down alcohol, but your liver can only handle so much alcohol at one time, approximately one ounce per hour. Your liver can handle one ounce. One ounce. I mean, how much, what is that, uh, a, a, a shot, right? I think. Or I don't even know if a shot is a little bit more than that, or no, is it one ounce? Like this little... Think of those little Dixie cups, right? Those little bathroom ones. I mean, how much are people drinking when they have a drink, when they, when they go out and drink alcohol? Like, that's, that's not much at all. But that's how much in a whole hour that your liver can handle actually just processing in what you might call a normal way. 
Therefore, heavy alcohol use can lead to liver diseases such as cirrhosis, liver cancer, alcohol-induced liver disease, hepatitis. Because your, your liver just can't, you're, you're inundating it with too much poison, too many toxins. That your liver is supposed to be cleansing for your body, but it, it, if it's inundated, it just can't deal with it all, and it just has to get pushed through your body and through the system, and it's going to damage your liver. The pancreas is essential for breaking down enzymes and starches, like those in alcohol. When the pancreas becomes irritated and inflamed, you can develop pancreatitis. Um, let's see, uh, there's, there's so much here. I'm not going to read all of this just for sake of time because I'm taking a little bit longer than I was thinking I would. Alcohol can impact your bones and lead to osteoporosis. Your immune system works to keep you healthy by fighting off for foreign invaders such as viruses, bacteria, and toxins. You probably know that already. Um, to your body, alcohol is a toxin. So the body sees alcohol as a toxin. This interrupts your immune system's ability to do its job because it's focusing on this toxin. So if you have other things coming in, bacteria or viruses or things that, that ought to be your immune system's primary focus, it's going to be in a way you know, distracted from that and be more likely for you then to uh, get more disease and get sick because your body is having to deal with this alcohol. Your central nervous system consists of the brain, spinal cord, neurons that communicate messages throughout your body. It powers key functions and processes like movement, memory, speech, thought processes, and more. Alcohol use suppresses the central nervous system and destroys neurons and kills brain cells, essentially. This can lead to conditions like stroke, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, is ALS, Alzheimer's disease, and multiple sclerosis. I mean, all of these effects, physical effects from alcohol, oh, let's just do it anyways. And there's even more. I'm not going to go through the rest of these. Let's see if there's anything. Oh, this is kind of important. This is going to play into a little bit more tonight as well. Uh, drinking alcohol can influence your psychological functioning and well-being. Alcohol influences neurotransmitters like dopamine and serotonin. And if you don't know too much about those things, dopamine is, is related to the pleasure that you feel or experience. That's why people call it dope, like, like getting high. I'm going to go into this more with the drug sermon tonight. Uh, that dopamine, that chemical that's in your brain when that's released, allows, you know, kind of helps your body to feel a certain way. And the serotonin is very similar. The more serotonin it's in your body will also um, have an impact on your feeling, how you, how you actually feel uh, physically. Now, alcohol influences these things. I'm going to go more in depth than that tonight. It, it, it really matters a lot with tonight's sermon. These brain chemicals are responsible for regulating your mood, concentration, motivation, and reward-seeking behavior. Alcohol is a depressant. While you may experience euphoria or relaxation at first, in the long run, alcohol affects neurotransmitters, which can lead to changes in your thoughts, moods, and behavior. And, and just at its core, what you know about Scripture, do you think God wants you ingesting a substance that's going to lead to changes in your thoughts, mood, and behavior as the result of this toxic substance? Because I think we're supposed to be in control of our bodies and we're supposed to let the Holy Spirit teach us and guide us and lead us into the way of truth and help us to walk in the right way, not some toxic substance that you're going to be ingesting in your body that also has the ability to impact and influence your mood, behavior, and your thoughts. Science is saying, look, this affects your thoughts. What did the Bible say in Proverbs 23? It says, thine eyes shall behold strange women and thine heart shall utter perverse things. So it's talking about your heart, it's talking about your mind, right? It's talking about the thoughts that you have. Perverted thoughts. Alcohol affects your thoughts. Why do they both say it? Because it's true. Because this information that comes from the scientist is a fact. 
It's a fact we know for sure because the Bible said it first. Science is just confirming, oh yeah, that's true. But truth is truth, like I said before. Truth is truth. Regardless of the source, if something is true, it's true. Alcohol use can exacer exacerbate mental health conditions like anxiety and depression. The anxiety and depression that people want to get rid of becomes worse through the drinking. It's a person who's real sad and depressed and, oh, I'm going to drink my sorrows away. Most often, more often than not, they're going to be even more blubbering idiots and sad and depressed and, and, and upset. And the, the alcohol only inflames and makes worse the, even the general feeling of miserableness. The misery that you feel oftentimes will just get amplified with alcohol, not reduced. I've got one other source here, and then it's going to be all scripture from here on out. This is from the World Health Organization. Okay? And look, they're not right about everything. We know that. But it's just a worldly source, and it's not only them saying this. You can get the same information. I'm just using it because it's a common worldly source. But this is what we're going to be reading about. This is still true. What is being said here about alcohol is true. And I'll read this for you. Look, this is just a lesson, so bear with me. If you've never heard this before, then listen up. I'm going to read this article for you, and, and, and then we're going to get back to Scripture. Alcohol is a toxic and psychoactive substance with dependence-producing properties, meaning it's addictive. You become dependent on it. The substance itself is addictive. So adding that, even drinking in moderation, you're drinking a substance that becomes addictive, that has dependence-producing properties. In many of today's societies, alcoholic beverages are a routine part of the social landscape for many in the population, which is exactly what it's like in the United States of America. I added that. This is particularly true for those in social environments with high visibility and societal influence, nationally and internationally, who's uh, where alcohol frequently accompanies socializing. In this context, it is easy to overlook or discount the health and social damage caused or contributed to by drinking. It's already recognizing, hey, we know this is in society, we know this is accepted, and we know in many uh, instances, especially of people of influence or people that have high visibility internationally, nationally, this is a common part of the culture and it's just accepted, which is why it's so easy to overlook the actual impact and the negative effects of drinking alcohol. It's easy to dismiss it. It's easy to overlook it. Even the World Health Organization is just starting off by saying that it's easy to just ignore this stuff. And that's what people want to do. But you know what? The truth of the matter is still the truth. I'll keep reading. Alcohol consumption contributes to 3 million deaths each year globally as well as to the disabilities and poor health of millions of people. Overall, harmful use of alcohol is responsible for 5.1% of the global burden of disease. 5% of disease has alcohol as uh, the, the, uh, the contributing factor there. And that's globally. I mean, that's a, that's a lot of people. 5% of the global population is a lot. Harmful use of alcohol is accountable for 7.1% and 2.2% of the global burden of disease for males and females, respectively. Alcohol is the leading risk factor for premature mortality and disability among those aged 15 to 49 years, accounting for 10% of all deaths in this age group. Disadvantaged and especially vulnerable populations have higher rates of alcohol-related death and hospitalization. Alcohol as an intoxicant affects a wide range of structures and processes in the central nervous system and increases the risk for intentional and unintentional injuries and adverse social consequences. Wounds without cause. Intentional and unintentional injuries. Alcohol has considerable toxic effects on the digestive and cardiovascular systems. 
Alcoholic beverages are classified as carcinogenic by the International Agency for Research on Cancer and increase the risk of several cancer types. Alcohol is an immunosuppressant, meaning it's suppressing your immune system. We already saw that from the other article, right? It, it, it weakens your immunity, increases the risk of communicable diseases. Both the volume of lifetime alcohol use and a combination of context, frequency of alcohol consumption, and amount consumed per occasion increase the risk of the wide range of health and social harms. The, risk, the risks increase largely in a dose-dependent manner with the volume of alcohol consumed and with frequency of drinking, and exponentially with the amount consumed on a single occasion. Surrogate and illegally produced alcohols can bring an extra health risk from toxic contaminants since any alcohol use, so the last little paragraph here, two sentences, since any alcohol use is associated with some short-term and long-term health risks, it is difficult to define universally applicable population-based thresholds for low-risk drinking. Now, this is the World Health Organization. Read between the lines a little bit here of what they're trying to say because they have to, uh, they still have to have some degree of political correctness. They can't just come out and just say, there is no uh, 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 acceptable threshold for drinking. I mean, they're literally kind of speaking out of both sides of their mouths with this last statement. Because they know that, that there's different cultures. They know they started off saying, hey, this is culturally acceptable and all this other stuff. But they can't just flat out be like, nobody should be drinking. Because there's a lot of politicians that fund the World Health Organization. Because there's a lot of other people of influence that want to use their information. So in order to try to straddle the fence here a little bit, they make a statement like, look, any alcohol use is associated with some short-term and long-term health risks. Just right off the bat, any, any consumption. So that, it's kind of hard to determine what's considered low risk. Low risk is zero alcohol consumption because any alcohol consumption is associated with health risks. That's what they just said. I mean, literally. So again, we look, you, you look at this information and be like, okay, I see the agenda. I know where they're coming from. They're trying to get the truth out there. They're trying to say things that they can't ignore the truth, but they need it to, to go down smooth. And that's why people say, oh, yeah, well, I mean, yeah, alcohol is a poison. Yeah, it's toxic. Yeah, people get intoxicated. Yeah, was, but, you know, if you drink a glass of wine a day, it's going to help your heart. And what, what does the Christian say? Yeah, but Jesus turned water into wine. Huh. When Jesus turned water into wine, you know what he didn't do? He didn't turn it into the Proverbs 23 wine. What turn of you into Leviticus chapter 10? And yeah, this is Old Testament. But did this change? Is, is wine somehow different in the New Testament than it was in the Old Testament? The physical substance just somehow is different. No. I'll read your turn in Leviticus 10. I'll read for you from Proverbs 31. Proverbs 31, verses 4 and 5, the Bible says, It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink, lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. So that's implying that when you drink alcohol, it's going to start perverting your judgment and your ability to uh, be righteous in the judgment of the law of God and even just forgetting the law, right? Why? You lose your inhibitions. You downplay things like the law. Well, it's not that big of a deal. That's why it's not for drinks, for kings to drink wine. And it didn't say, 
It's not for kings to drink too much wine. It's not for kings to drink wine, nor princes strong drink. Period. Look at Leviticus 10, verse number 8. And the Lord spake unto Aaron, saying, Do not drink wine, nor strong drink. Thou nor thy sons with thee, when ye go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die. Do you think God kind of feels a certain way about this? You don't step foot into that tabernacle. You drink wine or strong drink. You don't go in there or else you're going to die. Why, why is that such a big deal? Come on, loosen up, lighten up a little bit. Can I just have a drink? I get a little nervous. You got so many rules for me to follow, God. I mean, it's difficult. I've got, I've got all this stress of doing, I, I mean, if I don't do the sacrifice right, I mean, come on, let me loosen up a little bit. No. You're going to die. Lest you die. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations. And that you may do what? Put difference between holy and unholy and between unclean and clean. Do not drink wine or strong drink. Why? Because you need to set the example and show that there's a difference between clean and unclean. Amen. You need to show the difference between holy and unholy. Amen. That's why you don't drink that. And it's so important as you being that representative there and serving the Lord of hosts and offering up these sacrifices and all these great spiritual truths through the spiritual job that they're doing, hey, you separate that, whole, that unclean from the clean. You separate that unholy from the work that you're doing that's holy. You, have no, you, you do not include that at all. And then you have Christians wanting to drink alcoholic wine in communion. Which, by the way, in case you don't know, if you haven't heard this before, if you, if I've never, you haven't been here long enough or heard my preaching long enough, like at the marriage supper at Cana, I taught Jesus turned water into wine. We can tell from that passage, I'm not going to turn or you can read it later, when Mary confronted Jesus and said, hey, they don't have any wine. What did he say to her? He said, you know, woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour has not yet come. Jesus already tied the reference of his blood to that wine. Amen. Hey, they need wine. Hey, my hour isn't yet come. It's not time for me to shed my blood. The blood being shed is also referenced in the communion, the Lord's Supper, right? Hey, take and eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Take and drink. This is my blood which is shed for you. The body is always symbolized as being unleavened bread. Amen. Unleavened bread. Why? Because the leaven represents sin. Amen. So why in the world would the wine that you drink be leavened? Because alcoholic wine is fermented. The fermentation needs yeast, which is a leaven. It's the same thing to bread as it is to the drink. You don't want to have that leaven in the bread. Jesus was sinless. So it's blasphemous, blasphemous to include that leaven, that fermented wine, when you're symbolizing the blood of Christ. And you're going to tell me that after everyone at the party had already drank their wine, if you consider that to be alcoholic wine, that one, Jesus is hanging out with a bunch of people getting drunk, and two, he's providing them more booze? Yeah, right. You, you, you are, I mean, spiritually minded, you, you're an idiot. If you think Jesus is providing more booze, to people who have already drunk alcoholic wine and are getting drunk and have well drunk, because the Bible says they had well drunk, which means there was ample beverage for them to consume at that party, but they, they consumed it all. And then if you're going to say, well, Jesus provided them with more alcohol, you're an idiot. I mean, that's, that's, I mean think about it. What you're saying is that the bartenders that don't serve drunk people at the bar because they've had too much to drink is going to be more righteous than Jesus Christ. Nope, here you go. Party it up. Get more drunk. No. 
No, because you know what? The wine that they had at that, at that wedding was non-alcoholic wine. And Jesus provided more non-alcoholic wine. Because when they said, when the governor of the feast is like, wow, you've saved the best until now. Look, your, your senses, you, you get desensitized the more alcohol you consume. Okay, fact. I don't have the, the scientific paper to back that up right now. You can find that for yourself. But I'll tell you personal testimony. That's a fact. Yep. Man, I don't even, I'm not going to admit anymore. <laughs> it's a fact. Okay, people start drinking booze. What you're willing to drink after drinking booze, it gets disgusting. Stuff that you wouldn't normally touch without any alcohol, when it gets later and you want more, people will just drink whatever. That's a fact. That's one of the effects. You lose your inhibitions. Oh, that beer that someone else was drinking out of that sat down and walked out of the bar? Hey, why let it go to waste? Okay? You'd never do that. That's disgusting. But people get filthier the more of the unclean drink that you drink in your mind as well as just physically you're getting, you do filthy things. That's what happens with the booze. No, I lost my train of thought here. Better one. Thank you. John chapter 2. So when, there, when, when the governor of the feast is like, hey, you've saved the best till now, it's because he still has his sense of taste. And think about it this way, too. When you eat a meal, when you're really hungry or you're really thirsty, the first always is going to taste the best, right? I mean, it just does. And then the more full you get, the more you've had, you can still be, the whole thing can still taste good and be, and be pleasing. But as you get more satisfied, it's not quite as good as, as it was at the beginning. This is a testimony to that great, pure wine that Jesus served then, of being, look, you've saved the best to now. This is the best tasting. This is by far superior to what was already served here. And they could even notice that after they've already been supplied with sufficient amount to, to be satisfied of having enough. You would never be, that would not be a compliment from someone who's drunk. Oh, <laughs> you saved the best till last. You know, like, this tastes great. Yeah, you, you think the Totino's pizza rolls taste great, too. Look like at some <laughs> delicatessen. <laughs> if you know, you know. So, yeah, the, the, you know, the, the, that wasn't even in my notes. I do, where, where are we? Where did I have you turn? Deuter, De, your Leviticus 10, we already looked at that. All right, I'm not going into these other subjects. Just, just go to 1 Corinthians 5. We'll close out there. Deuteronomy 32, I'll read this for you. Write this note down if you haven't heard this one before. Deuteronomy 32, verse number 31. The Bible reads, For their rock is not as our rock, even our enemies themselves being judges. You're like, even if you ask them, you're saying, their rock is not like our rock. We've got a rock and they got a rock. Ask them. It's not the same. Their rock's not like our rock. For their vine is of the vine of Sodom. This is the children of Israel speaking about their enemies, about the heathen, about the uncircumcised Philistines, about all the wicked people, the heathen of the land. Their rock isn't like our rock. Their savior isn't like our savior. Their God isn't like our God. They'll even testify to that. They'll tell you, yeah, our God's different than their God. For their vine is of the vine of Sodom and of the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall. Their clusters are bitter. Their wine is the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of asps. That's their wine. Yep. Demonstrating there's two different kinds of wines. There's their wine and there's our wine. Amen. Their wine is poison. Their wine is from the vine of Sodom. Yep. 
which was one of my last points here. By the way, the Bible records this as well as it's just fact. The amount of perversion and coercion and abuse that happens as a result of alcohol consumption is unthinkable. How much rape, forcing of women and of men happens as a result of alcohol consumption. It happened in scripture. You can look at the story in Genesis chapter 9 with Noah. You can look in Genesis chapter 19 with Lot and his daughters. This is the fruit of getting drunk, of drinking their wine. That's of the vine of Sodom. It's all this perversion, all this forcing, all this, this really horrible stuff. And look, there's one way of making sure that you're not going to fall into that category. Kids, ladies, men, don't allow yourself to become inebriated and you're not able to defend yourself and you're not able to, to you know, back people off. And I would say not just inebriated, don't even start going down that path and start losing your good judgment. I mean, how many girls have been deceived by guys that just want to do one thing, that might just want to drug them, that might want to force them, that want, but they don't start off that way. When they approach you, they're not like, ha, 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 I want to do really bad things to you. They're going to smooth talk you. And you're dulling your senses with each drink. And you're going to not see some of the red flags and the warning signs because you're going to keep on, you keep on drinking. You start losing the cognitive skills. Your inhibitions are going to be lowered. You're going to give more into your flesh than being able to see things reasonably. With every drink you consume, you're just adding on more risk and more potential for harm and damage. There is no benefit to drinking any alcohol. Amen. Zero. Zero. Because the benefit that you could get from drinking that glass of wine, eat some grapes. Because when I talk about the benefits of, the, of that one glass of wine, I'll get back to, I'm getting back to it right now. It has to be the red wine, not the white wine, right? And it's the red. And what do you get from it? Antioxidants. Have you ever heard any other beverages being advertised as having antioxidants? Because I sure have. Pomegranate juice, right? Acai berry, yeah? Elderberry, yeah. mm -hmm. have you heard of these things? Like, like these are being promoted. Hey, look, they have antioxidants. Yeah. Skip the booze and eat some fruit that God made. Yeah. And you know what's funny is that the reason why they even say, oh, it's, it's got to be the, the red wine and everything else, and they'll say the red wine is better than grape juice. Why? Because it sits, the, because the, the antioxidants and the, the good the good stuff that you get, with supposedly, from drinking the wine. Because in grape juice, you don't let the juice sit on the peel. And the, 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 the grape peel, the skin, is where most of the antioxidants come from. So it's not from the pulp as much inside, but it's from the skin. So that makes sense. Okay, when you make juice, you're pressing it, and then you, you discard the skin. But then the wine, they let it sit in the skin because that's where the yeast comes from for the fermentation process and it gets the alcoholic properties and stuff and it's just sitting in that skin longer so it's able to get more out of that so let's say don't drink grape juice you could you know it's, it's not as good as the wine how about you eat the grape <laughs> how about you eat the grape <laughs> then you actually get all the skin how is that not going to be better I literally saw, when I was, I was researching, I was, I, was, I was trying to type this in. Because people are always trying to, to compare the grape juice with the wine. And when I saw that, I was like, well, how about just eating the grape? I typed in the question. There was a question that someone wrote into this website, this science website. The benefits between, well, like, is it better to eat grapes for the, 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 the benefit that you get than drink wine? And the answer was no, because wine has more of the antioxidants than grape juice. But that wasn't the question. The question was eating grapes, not drinking grape juice. 
I was just like, unbelievable. The, the question literally someone wrote in was about eating grapes. They answered it with grape juice, totally dishonest, totally insincere, and, and trying to say, oh no, the, the wine is actually better because there's more antioxidants in it. Stupid. Where does it get it from? It gets it from the grape. So how could, if you're eating the, the literal source, all of it, how could that be better? That's already removed some of the sort. You know, it's, it. But people will see what they want to see. And we ought to be driven by facts and driven by truth. What the word of God says is true. This is how we ought to be making our decisions. And, and just to, to illustrate here the, the, the real seriousness of this, besides everything else that we talked about, this is one of those sins, okay, that if you're a drunkard, is bad enough for you to be kicked out of church. 1 Corinthians 5 lists off particular sins, particular problems that you could have in your life, that if you're guilty of these things, you ought to, you're not going to be welcome in a biblical church. Our church is one of those churches. Okay, we have standards here, biblical standards. We love you. You said you're born again. You're a child of God. We want to want to help you. But when you get to a point where you are overcome with some of these problems that we're going to read about here in just a second in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, some of the best help for you is going to be tough love to where you have to realize, look, this is significantly damaging to my life if I'm going to be kicked out of the place that, that wants to help me, the people who love me and want to help me, Look, you've gotten to a point where you've got to realize, no, you're, you're going to have to, you're, you have to get this dealt with. It's that serious. Look at verse number 11. But now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother. So this isn't just people out in the world. This is someone who's called a brother. And this is someone that would have to be saved long enough to be known as a brother, right? Because God doesn't just expect you to know everything the minute you get saved. You have to hear the truth. You have to know what the Bible says in order to even have the opportunity or chance to repent, to get right and, and fix his problems in your life. Okay? But these are serious issues that need to be dealt with ASAP for the new believer. And definitely, if you're called a brother, you've been coming to church, you know these things. Look, this is what happens. And here's what the Bible says. If a man has called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such an one, know not to eat. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within. But them that are without God judgeth. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. Put away from among yourselves. It says, with such an one, know not to eat. It's serious. It's a big deal. Don't let your now look. If someone has a glass of wine or a beer occasionally, it's not okay. But that doesn't get you kicked out of church. Okay, it doesn't. That's not the standard. The standard here is a drunkard. But I. But it's still sinful to be consuming alcohol, and I think it's dangerous. Even if you disagree with it being a sin to have one beer or one glass of wine, if you disagree with me on that, you can't deny. The, the, the direction that that's going to lead you in. And, and what is it really worth anyways? These things are so simple to, to I'll put it this way. Okay, I, I know we're going a little bit over time, but, but this is important. It's important enough. The rules that you make for yourself. There are very significant pitfalls in this life in areas that you never want to ever have to go to or see, okay? For example, adultery, break a broken marriage. You never want to go there. So you know what I try to do to try to show some wisdom in that area is I set up rules for myself to make sure as much as possible that adultery is not going to happen in my relationship for me or my wife. 
So we make up boundaries, we set up rules that's gonna say, you know what, I'm not going to put myself in a position where it would be possible to do this. So being alone with someone of the opposite gender, just away somewhere, or building these relation, private relationships with people, if I were to do that with some woman that's not my wife, or she's doing that with some man that's not me, okay, we're not gonna let that happen because that's where adultery stems from. It comes from building these relationships. So look, if you want to be our friends, great. We love you, but you're going to be friends with me and my wife at the same time. And anything you could say to me, you could say to her. Anything you could say to her, you could say to me. And that's the way our relationship works. And you could either accept it or not. It doesn't matter because I treat my marriage way more important than my relationship with any other human being. So those are rules I set up. So similarly... You say, I never want to be drunken because there is no arguing drunkenness is a sin. None at all. Amen. Zero arguing against that. I don't care what position you take on any of these passages. You cannot, unless you just want to reject the word of God entirely. So in order to make sure I'm not going to get drunken, I'm not going to even have the first drink that's going to lower my inhibitions and potentially lead me to drink another one. And then potentially lead me to drink another one. Just not have any of it. How about that? I think that's showing wisdom. I think it's not being deceived by the uh, already proven addictive nature of alcohol itself. It's a fact. It's a fact. Alcohol is addictive. Alcohol is a poison. It damages your body. It provides no good benefit for you. Anything that you think you get from it, it actually is going to cause the problems to be worse. Every single time. Every single time. It's going to cause your heart to utter perverse things. Your eyes to behold strange women. It, it, it is the source of so many problems in this world. Your health, uh, spiritually, morally, everything. It's not worth it let's bow our heads have a word of prayer dear lord we love you thank you so much for the wisdom that you provide for us in scripture god i pray that you would please help someone today to to just come to the conclusion for themselves and say lord i will never touch this substance again and and i will never have it if they've never had it to begin with just to make the decision now that for the rest of their life they won't even want to try it or test it because there is no good thing that's going to come out of it, Lord. And, and God, we thank you for providing us with this truth. And God, um, we love you. Please lead us, direct us, and, and just uh, bless our church. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.